everyone and welcome back to the retro channel here we are back again with the commodore 1084s now if you haven't seen the last video definitely check that out first um, so we ended with a potential issue with this uh, when i turned it on it just seemed to go click and then nothing else happened now i wasn't sure exactly what the problem was but i did end up replacing the power switch that somebody put into the case and cut a nice hole for me to fix up so i've put an original power switch back in and also noticed there was a potential issue with the anode lead uh, it was resting on the back of the crt uh, on the dag ground so i'm not sure if that contributed to the issue i did think it had a little split in the cable but it may have just been some debris that was really stuck on there so i've cleaned that up i think it's okay um, but i guess time will tell i mean if need be i can put some um, some decent insulating tape or, or heat shrink over it. Um, but we'll go with that for now because it does seem to be working <clears throat> and I'm losing my voice. Seeing as I've got the back cover off at the moment, uh, we may as well set up the voltages because I did adjust the screen and focus back down on the flyback just in case. So I'm gonna have to reset them, but also show how to adjust the board voltage which is probably the first um, adjustment you should make. So the B plus voltage, which in the case of the Commodore 1084 SP1, uh, that should be 128 volts. Uh, I think the, the 1084 SD1, which is the Daewoo version, I imagine. That's how we say it in Australia. I think other places say it some other weird way. Daewoo. Uh, that's potentially different. I don't have a D1 to play with so check your service manual before you go adjusting that to 128 just in case it's different but for the P models which is the Philips version um, yeah 128 is what they specify so the way to set that up is just to clip a lead from your multimeter to the junction of resistor 3520 and diode 6453 so the resistor is one of those high wattage ones, so it should be pretty easy just to clip it on that leg. If you're looking at the back of the monitor, from the back, it's the right hand side of that resistor. And you just want to connect your ground to preferably just the shield around the, um, the RGBI input. A lot of these things, including this one, do have a hot ground, so you don't want to connect the ground lead to something that's potentially a hot ground, because then you're just going to get weird results and it's not going to make much sense so the um the little shield over the rgb input is probably the best way to go from there you just turn the little trim pot which i think is three four one four on the board uh it's sort of towards the back uh near the center it's a bit tricky to get around it with the um the neck of the crt sticking out but um yeah with all these things definitely use a plastic tool um, don't use something metal because you're dealing with high voltage and that metal is just asking for trouble. So always have a plastic tool, preferably plastic trim tools, which are pretty cheap to pick up if you pick up a crappy pair off eBay, which I did. But um, there are some good ones out there too, which I haven't splurged on yet. So once we've got the 128 volt supply set up to something that we're happy with, I, I dare say within 1% should be fine. The way I set up the screen voltage is just to turn the brightness and contrast all the way down and then adjusting the screen on the flyback, we just want to gradually bring it up so that we can see the retrace lines or the raster lines, whatever you want to call them. Whoa, that's too much. So it's sort of, it's a little bit slow to react. So you'll make an adjustment and then half a second later it'll it'll actually change what's going on on the screen. And so we want to set it up to a point where we want to have those lines visible and then just back it off so they just disappear. Um, and it's best to do this in a dark room. So let me just turn the light off. And obviously if you're working in the dark, um, make sure you don't just Make sure there's a little bit of light so you don't just stick your hand somewhere where it's not supposed to go. Whoa. So yeah, it's very touchy and it takes a second to react. So we want to have it down to the point where it just looks like the screen is off like this. 
right, yeah, I think that's good. It looks like it's off. So let's give it a signal. I'm just gonna use the old Super Nintendo because uh, I've got the 240p test suite available on there. So excuse me as I dash in front of the camera every five seconds. So let's bring up the brightness and bring up the contrast a little bit. Not that it's gonna make much difference because as you can see at the moment, the focus is way out. So that's the next adjustment we're gonna make. And obviously, once again, be careful what you're poking at. Don't go putting your hand in there. Probably a bad idea, especially with this one because the, the flyback is mounted so the controls face inwards from this side of the board. So it's a pain in the ass to adjust these, but it can be done. All right, focus is coming in. And we're just gonna keep turning it until it looks sharp so you can see the scan lines. And I'll just keep going a little bit more and it's starting to blur. So we wanna get it right in that sweet spot. It's just around here. So you wanna, this is kind of good having this line across here. So it makes it easy to get sort of a fairly uniform look. You can just make out the little phosphor dots or whatever you want to call them. I think that is as good as I'm going to get, but that looks pretty damn sharp. So I'm happy with that. Let's um, turn the light back on because the camera is not liking this. So yeah, there's a lot of lights in this room, so it's a bit tricky to actually make out, but to my eye, that looks pretty good. Even the color looks about spot on, but obviously you can adjust that to whatever suits your preference. Let's just have a look here. And the, there's a lot of light reflecting off the screen from the overhead lights, so it's tricky to see on the camera, but it looks pretty good. Obviously the contrast needs to come up. For this amount of light in the room, probably something around there looks about right. Um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. That looks quite good. I guess this one is sorted, which is awesome. There is one more thing left to do, which I also left off in the last video with, uh, which was replacing the speakers. So the original speakers are 16 ohm um, one watt little jobbies. And I did a lot of searching around because it's hard to find a 16 ohm speaker at three inches in size. So I did end up finding some Yamaha ones off an eBay seller. I'll put the model number in the video description, but I think it was the last ones they had, but I've put them into the case and they seem to fit fairly well. So let's take a look at that. All right, so here's the new speakers in the case. Uh, I did have to cable tie them in, but they did slot into those little grooves. Um, unlike the old speakers that have a fairly small back um, that these clips go around, the new speakers have a massive back, but they are still shielded. I think these are rated at 50 watts or something ridiculous. So um, that's definitely too much, but I needed something shielded that would fit in that spot with an impedance of 16 ohms. So options are pretty limited there. Now for the old switch, I am just going to pop it back in the side here just so I don't have a hole in there at the moment. So I don't stick my fingers in there for some stupid reason because that's probably something I'd do. So let's put the case back on. We'll hook the speakers back up and uh, give it a test, see what it sounds like. Let's just bring out this so we can test each channel. Uh, a button for right channel. That sounds good. This is your left channel. That also sounds good. We better f try it out with the game though. Ah, what do we want to play? Let's go Super Mario Kart. Sounds good. 
So the colors look pretty good. I don't have any plans on adjusting the bias or the um, cutoff or anything. So that is done. Case could use a little bit of a clean, but apart from that, I'm more than happy. And yeah, she goes loud. Oh no, and I broke the little bit. Focus. I broke the little bit off the, um, the front cover. I think it was already broken, it was just sort of dangling, but now it's completely snapped off, so I'll have to fix that. At least I've got the actual front cover, so usually you don't. <laughs> A lot of those things have disappeared over time, so cool. Let's take a look at the other two monitors and see what they do. They haven't been powered on or anything, so they may go up in smoke, but there's one way to find out. Just after one more lap. That's not supposed to happen. Maybe our high voltage is shorting somewhere. Right, I've got the back off. It's very dark in here. I'm just recording off the phone camera, but I did manage to get it to make that noise. And I'm just got a, that plastic tool just underneath the main board, just jiggling it around. So I don't see any arcing anywhere. So I think it is just a bad solder joint. Um, and it's causing interference through the speaker and also through the display, like visible interference. So I'm just going to pull it all out and obviously discharge everything and just check some solder joints, but I'm hoping that it's just a bad joint and it should be an easy fix. All right. So it turns out the issue was with the flyback and when I was pushing on it before, it was making that buzzing noise, but now that I've taken it off and resoldered it and cleaned up the flux that was hiding under there, it seems happy. And naturally I've been distracted by playing Mario. The next day. All right. Yes, it is the next day. I did spend a couple of hours just making sure that other monitor was stable. So let's move on to the, I think this is the 10, this is the 1081. And I've got the 1084 down on the floor over there. I think the only real difference between these two is the 1084 looks to have um, the separate Chroma Luma inputs or Commodore video, I think they called it. Whereas the 1081 has just got a composite input, uh, SCART and uh, TTL RGB. So we'll start off with the 1081 because it's the first thing I picked up. Now I do have the back cover removed and here we've got an isolation transformer. So the mains is plugged into this. Um, so this pretty much will isolate any hot grounds from the mains. So as I showed in the 1084S just earlier, it does have some hot grounds. So we don't want to accidentally touch one of those. Um, so this pretty much decouples it from the mains. Uh, we've also got a light bulb here. This is a 150 watt incandescent light bulb. Uh, so this is our dim bulb tester. So this sits in series with the power supply. So the mains is coming into the isolation transformer through this light bulb and then into the CRT. So ideally when we turn this on, the light bulb should light up a little bit because it is drawing a lot of current through the light bulb but it shouldn't light up completely. If it lights up completely, then we know that there's potentially a short circuit in the CRT and hopefully this will take most of the heat from that and not do any damage to any of the components inside. So that's the idea. Uh, I'm not sure if this rating light bulb is gonna be high enough. It might need a 200 watt one, which 
could be tricky to source these days. And I have disconnected the degaussing coil um, just because that draws a high amount of current when you first switch the TV on and quickly decreases to basically zero um, through a, a persistor, I think they're called. So that's disconnected. It doesn't make any difference. It just means that the CRT is not going to get degaussed when we initially turned it on, but it probably doesn't work anyway. When I've got the 1081 and the 1084 off a guy um, in Sydney, he said one of them was working and one of them wasn't, and I didn't take notice of which one was which. So I assume one of these is going to work, but I guess there's only one way to find out. So I'm going to power it on with the button. If I can tell which way is on. All right, so the monitor should be switched on at the front switch. So once I flick the switch on the isolation transformer, it should just power up. Um, what I'm gonna do is you can watch the front, the screen, and I'll bring out a second camera and watch the back and we'll see what happens. Well, that actually sounds good. I can hear the high voltage. I don't see anything odd going on in the back. So maybe this one just works. This could be just the working one. Let's take out the bulb because I don't think we're going to need that anymore. All right, so the bulb was out of circuit. We're just going through the isolation transformer straight to the CRT. Let's try this again. Yeah, it sounds about right. Um, so I guess the next thing to do is hook something up to it and see if we get an image on the screen. Well, I can barely see in the reflection that Something is going on on the screen, so that's a good sign. This one is quite noisy. That 15 kilohertz, whatever it is, is ear piercing. And I'm sure young people are screaming at me like, make it stop. Um, I can see the filament, the heater and the filament. Well, I can see the heater in the neck is warmed up and it's got a nice orange glow to it. So. So far, this looks pretty good. This is the one with the dodgy button. All right, allow me to join you over this side. Bloody switch. Somebody should replace that. There's no LED for the switch. So we should be seeing the Super Nintendo on the screen, but we are not. Yeah, we're definitely getting a signal out, so. just not displaying anything here. It does actually change when I feed it the signal. I can hear that high voltage change, but. Oh, it almost locked on. Ah, maybe I just need to clean the plug because it is quite crusty as well. All right, all right, hold that. Uh, it's pretty well centered. Colors it way out. 
All right, I'm just going to pause the video here for a second. One thing I noticed during editing is that I have the isolation transformer right next to the CRT. Now, this isn't ideal because it does put off a strong magnetic field, but I did the test again with the same setup later on, and it turns out it wasn't causing the color issue that we're seeing here. But um, just one thing to note, if you're doing this kind of test, make sure you've got the isolation transformer as far away from the CRT as possible. Anyway, carry on, dickhead. Mm. So yeah, the colors are way off. Obviously, this here is supposed to look like this here, and it certainly don't look like that. The camera is not liking this. I can't see that on the actual screen at the moment. That's just the camera doing weird stuff, trying to synchronize itself with the 50 hertz signal, but yeah, we are missing colors. So what I'm gonna do is discharge everything, clean this up and have a good inspection of the board. I'm not sure if it's just one of the guns is not working. All right, so I disassembled everything. I went around and just cleaned up um, some of these pots. Obviously I haven't touched the ones on the board that control the color drive and voltages, things like that. Just the user accessible ones on the front and back. Um, just sprayed some contact cleaner and just sort of worked it in. And same with these RCA jacks and the SCART connector, just to make sure everything's cleaned out there while I've got this all out in the open and accessible. The next thing I did was just went around the board on the top side and just did a visual inspection of the components just to see if anything looked unusual. Um, everything seems to check out. So flipping to the underside of the board. Now I like to check the solder joints, especially on something like the flyback and any sort of user controls or where cables connect because they're obviously under a bit of strain and sometimes those solder joints can break. The way I like to do this is actually use my phone camera and just manually zoom in and then just slowly work my way across the board just looking at each of the um, the solder joints and every so often you'll spot something that looks a bit unusual. It's an easy way to check these things out without using you know a magnifying glasses or, or a, a microscope. It's, it's easy just to move the phone around rather than trying to move the board around under something. So this is how I prefer to do it. And what I did spot was in this area just here. Um, if you look closely, there is some heat build up around here. And also some of these solder joints do have a little sort of circular ring around them, which can indicate that there it's a bad solder joint. Sometimes it's just excess flux that's just sort of been left and has created half like a semicircle around the joint. But yeah, these ones look a bit odd and there's obvious signs of heat build up. There is a large, not a huge, but a two watt resistor in that area. And the other things around it are actually paired in three. So it tells me that um, the RGB signals are going through this area. And looking at the schematics, I can see that um, these three transistors uh, are actually feeding uh, I think they're setting up the voltage for another three transistors that are actually driving the RGB um, going to the netboard and then to the guns themselves. So it's possible there's an issue around this area just here where that heat buildup is um, and those joints look a bit iffy. So what I'm going to do is just pop out these three transistors. I'm just going to test them out of circuit one at a time because I think they are all different um, types. So I don't want to mix them up. But seeing as I want to reflow those joints, I may as well just desolder them 
check them out of circuit and then if they're all if they seem okay I can put them back in otherwise I can replace them so that's what I'm going to do for now um, see if we find anything unusual it could just be bad solder joints but uh, it's worth testing those things especially where you can see something that has built up heat so that's what I'm going to do All right, so it's reassembled. I even plugged the speaker back in and put the case back on. So let's see what happens. I think that's on. Yes, it is. And we've got colors. Blue, red, yellow, green. Awesome. It's not the best looking image in the world, but after a bit of calibration, I may go through and recap the whole thing, but it's not strictly necessary, I don't think. Like, there doesn't seem to be any major issues. Otherwise, we would have probably known about them pretty early on. So, a recap may make things just a smidgen better, but it's not going to do worlds of difference. Uh, let's see if the sound works. Uh, Actually, that's a good, good soundtrack on this one. Ooh. It's not very loud. It's as loud as it goes and it's certainly not very loud, but it works. The sound is there. I'm only running it through composite video, so the image isn't great, but it's still pretty sharp. Like I said, some more fine tuning adjustments and we'll be laughing, I think. So I think I'm going to have to leave the video here because obviously it's gone on quite long by now and we've still got one more to look at. So we'll get to that in the next episode. But uh, as always, thanks for watching the Retro Channel. Big thanks to my supporters on Patreon. Um, yeah, if you'd like to sign up and become a patron of the channel, please check out the links in the description below. You'll get early access and ad-free videos, all that kind of jazz. And um, beyond that, thanks for watching the Retro Channel. See ya. One thing I noticed is the 1084S really bloomed when bright things came on the screen. This one doesn't seem to do that. So I'm curious as if there's still more work to do with the 1084S. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any theories, um, let me know down in the comments. Because um, yeah, this one certainly doesn't suffer that same blooming issue. Looks pretty damn good. Um, yeah, anyway, thanks for watching. Bye.